Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. So I need some volume. I, I may be on, I may not be on. There we go, that'll work. Can you bring it down just a tad? Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. That'll work. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, did you guys get taken aback by um, our loss of an hour? So you know you've been through this at least for 25, 30, 40, 50 years now. You know that, right? Um, so you should have been prepared. All right, I'm going to expedite our class in an opening of prayer. Let me see here. Um, <clears throat> so Thomas, I'm going uh, to run you up there to get a bulletin for me because I don't, I don't have one. I need to be able to follow your bulletin to make sure you guys are all right. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we're asking for your grace, even as you have shown it to us all of our lives, and you have shown it to us in the salvation of our souls, and you have shown it to us in your providence uh, and keeping care of our souls, the souls of our individual lives, our families, etc. So many reasons for which we are to worship you and to honor you and to glorify you with our lives. We are utterly thankful for your faithfulness to us and your grace to us in Jesus Christ, your son. We are thankful for the forgiveness of sins and we are thankful for that righteousness by which we are called sons and daughters of God. As we enter into your word this morning, we're asking for grace to pay attention and to be able to receive that for which you have laid down your life in your son Jesus and have given us this glorious book called the Bible, the Biblion, and the revelation of your glory in your son Jesus Christ. May we comprehend the unfolding riches of who he is and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for the church of God all over the world with all of the challenges and all of the battles and all of the struggles that they along with us have as we live in this world. Set aside all unnecessary hindrances so we can hear you and benefit from your word. Spirit of God, help us in, in this hour. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> we are in the book of Revelation. I really don't want to do a whole lot of re recapitulation from last week because we are doing an overview of the book before we actually deal with targeted chapters in the book of Revelation, but if you follow in your outline, I'm going to kind of briefly talk through the first two <clears throat> or three points, and we will press into point number three more particularly today. Last week, as we talked about the book of Revelation, one of the things I began to do was talk to you about the very term revelation. That is what you read in the top of your Bibles. The superscription of the last book of the Bible is called Revelation. Literally, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the way we get it in verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. And we said that word revelation literally is the word apocalypse in our English language. And we divided that into a prefix and a basic noun to take away or to unveil or to uncover is what the term means. For our sake, understand that the idea of the revelation of Jesus Christ, particularly the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, is not some new idea or some new genre or some new terminology in contradistinction to the rest of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's very important for you to know that as we press into the framework and some of the genre and terminology that's going to help you interpret the book of Revelation in a more coherent way in weeks to come. Your Bible is from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 and 21, an unfolding revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you get that picture? 
your Bible from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22 and 21 is an unfolding scroll that has been unfolding in the purposes of God for thousands of years, both historically and in what we call God's primary means of truth, our depository of truth called the scriptures. So when you read your Bible from Genesis 1, verse 1 to Revelation 22 and 21, it is a gradual, incremental unfolding of a scroll. Do you see the picture? It's important for you to know that. The book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is not to be viewed as separate from the book of Jude or separate from third or second or first John or sec separated from the book of James or the book of Hebrews or the book of Peter or the Acts or the Gospels. Do not separate them. They are a concurrent flow of continual revelation of the same subject, and that is the person and work of Jesus Christ from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 and 21. Now that your bodies are in the room, if you heard me and understood what I just said, raise your hand. Right, it's important for you to know that uh, visually I want you to understand that the privilege of reading the revelation of Jesus Christ is that we are coming to a close. We are coming to what is called an eschaton of the revelation, a final unfolding of the revelation of God's glory in Christ. And if we tracked with God from Genesis all the way through Malachi and Matthew, all the way through Jude, if we've been keeping up with God, then we will have the material to be able to understand this unique book of the apocalypse that gives us symbolism and typology and metaphor and language that is congested with uh, a kind of coded motif, which won't really throw you and I aside because the coded motif of genre and metaphor and analogy and typology and symbolism and numerology and a few other things are all in the previous books of the Bible. They are all in your previous books. So that if you and I understand the benefit of Old Testament, New Testament, first and last, beginning and end, then we understand we have everything necessary for us to comprehend this book called the Apocalypse or the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So under our first point, let me quickly run through that. I'm not going to unpack it at length. Okay, good. Under our first point, just pull up our first point so I can roll through this. The central thing that you want to keep in mind when you are reading the book of Revelation is not to get lost in the forest for the trees. You want to be disciplined to know how to stay on the main highway. There are people who love to take side roads and go visit little, uh, really narrow canals and offshoots in the forest, in the woods, and that's how you get lost. And particularly if you don't have a compass to the main road back, you get lost. And a lot of people get lost in the book of Revelation is because they don't know where the main road is and they don't know how to stay on it. The main road is a person and that person is Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that just to be preaching to you. I, you know, I'm saying that because it's important for you to know that when God has chosen to make clear to his redeemed people who he is, he's done it in a person, not merely in events, but in a person. And that person is Jesus. Now, you hear a lot of people talking like I'm talking now, but I've shared it with you for many years. Those of you who have been with me for a long time, I don't find many men or women or teachers radical in the centrality of Jesus as the subject of their text. I don't. I hear a lot of people talking about Jesus is everything, but I don't see it and hear it in their teaching. And I'm here to tell you when the Bible opens up, making it plain, the revelation of Jesus Christ then it's letting us know, here's how you get on the main road of the book of Revelation. If you stay on that road, you're going to be good. And so it's important for you and I right now to understand that the subject-object relationship between God and us, we're the subject, God's the object. The subject-object relationship between us and God and God and us in this study that's going to take place for several weeks will require you appreciating a, re a relationship with God. For you to benefit from our series is going to require you to appreciate a, re a relationship with God. This series will not benefit you if you aren't committed to a relationship with God in Christ. This book is about Christ, but it's to the redeemed. 
And if at any time in the unfolding of this series, you feel like this is not for you, hurry up and mark yourself because that's a danger. If you don't feel like anything that's being said in the study of the revelation is not for you, you're in danger of not being the redeemed because this book is to the redeemed. This is the way it opens up. So under our first point, the rule of Christ revealed the rule of Christ. That other of shouldn't be there. The rule of Christ revealed to his what? Church. The rule of Christ revealed to his church. So what the church gets to see in this post-cross era around A.D. 90 to A.D. 100 is a revelation of the one in whom they have been believing for 60 years. They have been believing that Jesus rose from the dead and ascended on high and is seated at the right hand of God. They have been believing that for some 60 years. And now here comes that Jesus giving them a revelation of his rule. What a privilege. And so your Bible opens up with him being the subject and the church, the redeemed being the object. Listen again to what it says over in verse uh, four. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Then you have a semicolon. Leave it there. Just in terms of getting a grounded. This is what we call interpret an interpretation observation. You have to have the key of observation to establish a foundation of what's being said. Whenever you hear the word of God read, you got to hear what it is says before you begin to deal with what it means. So look again at verse uh, four, John to the what? Seven churches. There you go. This book is to us if we're, in, if we're believers in Christ. And I want to receive everything I possibly can from it. Now, going back to our PowerPoint, let me quickly move through these points again to reaffirm just a few things. And you can pick up last week's CD if you didn't or get it online and listen. And I would definitely recommend if you want to get a handle on the framework of the overview so that once we begin to dive into the text, you won't be saying, I don't understand what he's saying. Well, the only way you can understand is to have an interest in what is being said. And so that's why I'm spending the time to lay a foundation. Point number one, the rule of Christ revealed to his church. Sub point A, B, C, and D. His primary, <clears throat> his primary audience are the what? Y'all see that? Many verses substantiate that. We won't go to them. His session, you see sub point B? His session and rule are what? All right, so let me go back to the word session for those of us who went to grammar school in Oakland. The word session means to rule, to occupy, occupy a place of authority. When a judge is in session, he's occupying the seat of adjudicator and adjudicating over issues of law. When a king is in session, he's sitting on his throne, engaging in deliberating righteousness over the people. Christ is in session and he has been in session since he rose from the dead and ascended on high. He is what? Seated at the right hand of God. Session and seated are what are called combined metaphors. When the king sits, he is in what? Session. When he sits on his throne, he exercises judgment. This is where you and I saw last week that <clears throat> the primary thing you're going to see running through the book of Revelation is the concept of the throne, Basalia, the throne, the throne of God, the throne of Christ, the throne of the Lamb, the throne. And we looked at <clears throat> that in many uh, places. Look at verse five again, Revelation chapter one, verse five. <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Do you see it? And the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse six. And he has made us kings and priests unto God and to his father. To him be glory forever and ever. And we learned last week what that meant. You'll see that in our last point, or at least in our uh, third point, the church co-labors in Christ's what? In his rule. The church co-labors in Christ's rule, does he not? The church co-labors in Christ's rule. Is that what that verse would be saying? Watch it now. This is just called observation of the text. It's not even anything but saying what it says. And he hath made us kings and priests. Unto God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. And if Christ is king and he's made us kings, 
And if Christ rules, do we not rule? If Christ is the priest and he's made us priests, do not we occupy the office of priesthood? And we've used that nomenclature forever, have we not? And so a beautiful thing is going on in chapter one. Chapter one is, is an opening, what is called an, uh, 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 a prologue to the whole dialogue where Christ is actually taking his time to explain to us who it is that's writing, to whom he's writing, and the privileges of those to whom he's writing. He's taking the time to let the church know its position, its power, its relationship with the one who's writing to it. Can you see it? He's taking his time to let us know that the contents of the letter are not only the people that I'm writing to in a casual way, but people I love, people I died for, people who are seated with me at the right hand of God, people of whom we have designated royalty, people for whom we have made to be priests. Now, the last sub point in this uh, first point is a triune collaboration in and through the church. So absolutely magnificent. I could waste my time on point number one, but we were there last week. I just want to help you learn how to appreciate what's said. Because the one to whom, uh, the one who is writing is letting you and I know, not only is he revealing himself to us for our clarity and comfort, but he's revealing us to us for our clarity and purpose. He's revealing us to us for our clarity and purpose. It's a great thing when the CEO or the boss of the company comes to you, sits you down, reminds you of the contract that you hardly ever read and lets you know the privileges and benefits in that contract and actually tell you where your honor is and where your promotions are going to be. His plan to promote you and to use you and to purposely engage you. And here's the greatest thing. When the CEO comes to you and says, look, I'm going to get this thing done through you, not apart from you. You are not a contingent part. You are a critical part. It's amazing. So I'll leave that there because it's such a profound truth. A triune collaboration in and through the what? All right. So the rule of Christ revealed to his church, which is his primary audience, his session and rule over the universe. We saw that the church co-labors in Christ's rule and there is a triune collaboration in and through the church. Once again, we identify God the Father. Look at it again over in verse four. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from watch. Him which is and which was and which is to come. That's called the Father. And watch. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. That's called the third person. And watch. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You see the triune God there? Do you see the triune God there? Get this. Jesus didn't write you a letter. All three persons did. All three persons are so absolutely enamored with and interested in the body of Christ that the revelation is coming from our daddy, his servant, and our husband. And they're all three engaged in wanting to draw you into a conversation that's about to last 22 chapters to help you see the world in terms of his rule through his church for his glory. Is that good? It's important for you to capture. Point number two. Point number two. I need to keep moving because I'm getting ready to get into some pretty rough waters for you. Point number two. Christ is revealed in his session, as we've seen in Revelation 1, 4. We see it also in Revelation 5, 6. This is the first time. Second time. Revelation 5, 6. Pull it up. This is the second time you will see the concept of thronos. Thronos. The rule of Christ. The throne of Christ. Look at Revelation 5, 6. Watch this. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the what? Right. Now, when John uses that term, he's saying, I've actually have talked to you about the throne before. And that's in Revelation 4, 1. But don't go there. So we're already used to the heavens being open and a monarch being revealed to us. And I've said it for years. If you have a right understanding of God, 
All the prophets of God, all the servants of God have seen God as one way, a monarch, a king. The moment you diminish God from his monarchy, you disrespect who God is as a person. You cannot have a redemptive relationship with God if he's not a monarch, because we're nothing but servants. He's a redeeming monarch, and we're nothing but slaves for whom he purchased. He's a loving monarch, and we become the wife who was a slave of whom this king purchased. And so we're comfortable with God being on a throne running the universe, for which you have dozens and dozens of verses from the Old Testament to the New with God on his throne. The Lord is in, on his throne in his holy heaven. Let all flesh keep silence before him. That's the God we serve. So when, un, when Revelation opens up, when the unveiling takes place, we don't get a different view of God in the Old Testament than we do in the New. One true and living God, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do you see it? So, now watch this. I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood as it were a what? There's your juxtaposition. A throne and a lamb. Well, we know this is the motif that's going to run through the whole Bible, right? Authority on the basis of a sacrificial atonement. Authority on the basis of a sacrificial atonement. Authority on the basis of the lamb who said to his apostles, all power and authority has been given unto me in all the world. Therefore, go into all the world and do what? You see the motif? You see the imagery? Authority on the basis of the one who loved us and died for us. Now watch this. In the midst of the throne were also the elders. And there is that lamb that had been slain. So that gives us the motif of passings, having seven horns and seven eyes. We've already seen that back in Revelation chapter 1, 4. The seven spirits of God, did we not? So the, the Lord Jesus as the lamb possesses the spirit of God. You can't separate the spirit of God from the lamb. You can't separate the power of God from the cross work of Christ. You cannot separate the redemptive work of God by the spirit from the risen, exalted lamb. That's Jesus. Are y'all tracking with me? The Holy Ghost doesn't operate apart from, but rather through the exalted lamb. He has seven horns. That means the horns are ontologically tied to his body. The horns represent what? Power. The eyes on the horns represent what? Wisdom. And they are both ontologically tied to the what? Lamb. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 24, he is the wisdom and power of God. Do you see it? Do you see it? See, now what you're experiencing right now while I'm talking to you, you know, don't mind my passion. That's just how I am. I love the word of God and I love this book. You are on a journey of metaphor and typology and symbolism and imagery, but there's a narrative underlying it that you've already heard, haven't you? It's called the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It's just now done in coded language for people who are interested. For people who are interested. And now going back to our, our second point so I can make my way through. So we have not only Christ in his session, but Christ in his care, Christ in his care. I said that this is important because when we get to dealing with the seven churches of Asia Minor, when we begin to deal with them, that's his inaugural vision. That is his primary vision. To understand the book of Revelation, you got to understand Christ as a king and as a what? Shepherd, priest, a king, shepherd, priest. The term shepherd is pastor. And the offices of pastor in the Old Testament were monarchical and priestly, weren't they? They were monarchical and priestly. We are kings and priests. Well, what is the shepherd? He's the one that watches over the flock. What is the priest? He's the one that cares for the flock, for the health of the flock. What you see in Revelation 2, 1, pull it up, is our Melchizedek. We talked about it last week. I won't develop it now. He's certainly not an Aaronite, and he's certainly not a Levite. The book of Hebrews completely demolishes the notion of an Old Testament motif of the temple system being applied in the New Testament. Levi's days are over. The priest of the people of God cannot be Levitical or Aaronic. It has to be Melchizedekian. Y'all with me? 
I'm just doing this for time's sake. I can't do anything but lay down these plummets right now for time's sake. If you know your Bible, you already know. We're not looking to Aaron. We're not looking to Levi. We're looking to Melchizedek. So from here on out in the book of Revelation, presume that whenever the priesthood motif and the temple motif are used, it's not the Old Testament. It's the New Testament. Y'all got that? And the centrality of the rule of the New Testament is a covenant called the new covenant by a new priest. And that priest is Jesus. And that will help us unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven what in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven what golden candlesticks. Now we have that Old Testament motif of the what the uh, menorah. Why? Because the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches. I could stop here and get into the number system, but you'll see that in your outline. The fact that he wrote to seven churches in that time doesn't mean that those letters were confined to seven churches. There were more than seven churches in Asia Minor to whom these seven letters went. He stopped at the number seven because his people have understood the significance of the number seven from the time that God created the world. Covenant people understand covenant language. From the time God created the world, six days the Lord worked and on the seventh day he rested. We clearly understand that we're dealing with a sim symbolism of perfection and completion, not a literal number to whom the churches were written. Historically, we know that these letters went to many other churches that came to us. So the number seven is going to be another uh, method of interpretation that will help us understand when God is speaking to the completion and perfection of his own work. You see that in your outline. So going back to our point, notice in the church is revealed and the, uh, Christ is revealed to his church in his session in his care. What does that mean? The high priest is walking through the seven churches. And what is he doing? He's disciplining the church. He's developing the church. And he's defending the church. Remember those three D's, discipline, development and defending, because once we get into the seven churches, that's what you're going to see the shepherd doing, disciplining, defending and developing the church, which is what he does with all of his churches. And we're going to get a chance to look at the big mirror that will show us where we are in our uh, relationship with the great shepherd of the sheep. Uh, sub point. B. Sub point uh, B should be C. Sorry. Sub point C. The conquest of Christ. This is a very important concept because over in Revelation chapter six, we see the term of the lamb used again. Revelation chapter six, verse 14. Revelation six, 14. I'm going to read Revelation six, 14 through 17. And the reason why I'm going here is because we're getting ready now to move from the uh, imagery and motif of the high priest shepherd dealing with the seven churches into him opening up heaven, opening up heaven and showing the church his rule from the throne over against the affairs of the world to let the church know that what they are going through in this life is not without the intimacy and concern and care of the sovereign king who is on the throne, who is also their shepherd, who is also their priest, who is also their brother, who is also their Lord, who is also their husband, who is also their redeemer and savior, who is also their alpha and their omega and their first and their last. So that the people of God don't have to worry about what's going on in the world. We don't care about the coronavirus. God's on the throne. He's on the throne. We don't care. All things are working after the counsel of his own will. Everything works together for the good to them that love God. There shall no, there shall no evil befall them that fear him. Oh, my sovereign's on the throne and he's opened the door for these afflictions to occur. Good. Let us bow down before him. Let us call upon the Lord our God. Let us worship him so that he can seal us and cover us and shadow us. In fact, this is why you have chapter six preceding chapter seven. Watch this. In chapter six, it says, and the heavens departed as a scroll. I'm going to talk about that for the next 20 minutes. The scroll, mark the scroll, okay? 
and the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together and every mountain and island were removed out of their place. Stop right there. Unless you are a child and enjoy imagery and cartoons and, and, and uh, moving pictures, you don't even get this image. This image is the image of the closing of time, the ending of time, like a scroll that's rolled up. Remember I shared with you that your Bible is a scroll from Genesis 1-1 to, Gen to Revelation 22 and 21 that rolls open. You guys got that? And when God is done with time, what does he do? Close the scroll. Do you see the picture? And when the scroll is closed, there is nowhere to hide. Everything now is open and naked before him with whom we have to do. This is the end of time. And this is a beautiful metaphor because while the scroll is opening, watch this now, God is talking. Because what's on the scroll written on the back side and the front side is the word of God. While the scroll is opening, God is talking. Lo, I come in the volume of the scroll. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. While the scroll is opening, God is talking. The only people really care are his redeemed people. God opened the scroll. And let me hear everything you have to say from the utterances of your decree and your authority and your sovereignty. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's what's going on now. The scroll is closing because we have a motif of the end time here. A motif of the end time. Remember that because I'm going to argue against the strict chronology of the scriptures that you can't do that with the book of Revelation. Right here, the world is coming to an end. And we're only in the sixth chapter. Well, that's going to happen two or three more times before we get to Revelation 21. What's going on? As we'll see when I'll give you the image in a moment that you and I are dealing with recapitulation principles that deal with progressions of revelation that are circular in nature because God deals with us in epics where he starts something and finishes something and starts it again and finishes it again in order to repeat the lesson in our lives. <clears throat> Pastor, I don't get you. Well, every human being is a perfect type of it. Every human being is a perfect type of something started and ending. Every human being is born and every human being dies. And that recapitulation principle has been going on since Adam up to the very day that you and I are in existence. We aren't all born at the same time. We are born at overlapping times, successive times, progressive times. Are we not? We live and have a whole circle of life and then we what? That's how it works. And the revelation is just like that. We live and come to our end and die. And sometimes I'm burying people on the same day I'm celebrating the birth of other children. Because that's how God works. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That's how God works. And watch this in verse 15. Because I want you to see the featured person. And the kings of the earth and the great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, every bondman, every freeman, hid themselves in the rocks and the dens of the mountains. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. There it is, session. There it is, authority. Now everybody's worried about the one we've been calling Kyrios. Now they're worried about him. They should have been worried about him while he was occupying his throne of mercy. But there is no throne of mercy here. This is a throne of strict justice. The throne of mercy comes through the preaching of the gospel by the priestly kings. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Very important to capture this motif. He said unto them, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. And there it, is, there it is again. And from the what? Wrath of the Lamb. That's a motif of the end time. Now guess to whom Christ wrote that? Us. Not the world. He did not write this vision for the world. He wrote it for the church because the very captains and kings and chief men are persecuting and killing the believer. That's, that's the earlier part of chapter 6. We're dealing with the seven seals right now in chapter 6. And what Christ is giving to the church that's being persecuted is a picture that one day the lamb that's sitting on the throne will come and destroy all of those leaders who are persecuting the people of God. Y'all got that? The great shepherd who will defend his church. This is the language that I want you guys to capture under that second motif. This is called conquest language. Verse 17. Here it is. Verse 17. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Awesome language. Often, ap often absent in preaching. Often absent in preaching. The authority and power of Christ to come and destroy the world is not uh, popular language today. Third, third point, 
because I want to move into um, our third point. We'll, we'll, more, we'll get into these things in more detail. Third point, the apocalypse is a proto-eschaton of redemptive history. You guys see that? All right. The apocalypse is a proto-eschaton of redemptive history. I wish that I um, could develop this more vividly, but for right now, this is what I want you to capture. Prata in the Greek means first. Eschaton means last. Just get that. First, last. Prata, eschaton. Prata, eschaton. Prata eschaton. The apocalypse is a proto eschaton of redemptive history. The book of the Revelation gives us the creation motif. It gives us the redemptive history. And then it gives us a final motif of recreation paradisial image. The book of Revelation gives us the picture of paradise, of a new Adam, a new people of God. That genre starts early as Revelation 2.7. Revelation 2, 7, please watch this. In Revelation 2, 7, Christ gives one of multiple promises to the church. Here it is. He that overcometh shall do what? He that overcometh. Revelation 2, 7, please. He that overcometh. Watch this. He that hath ears, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the what? Stop. Is that eschaton or proton? It's proton. That's what you got in the Genesis narrative. That's what you got in God creating the heavens and the earth in six days. That's what you got in the midst of that, that ideal scenario of a, a righteous man and a righteous woman without sin in relationship to a holy God in a perfect environment that have four streams of rivers running through it to water the whole earth and of all of the trees of the field you could eat. And there is also that tree of life. Remember that? That's at the beginning. This is what we call a protological picture. Protos meaning that what God did in the beginning, and I've said it for grace for many years, you got to understand Genesis 1 through 3 because Genesis 1 through 3 is the framework for the whole Bible. In seed form, God gave you the whole plan of redemption in first things. First things become a framework for last things. Eschatology has absolutely no meaning apart from a protological framework. Did y'all hear what I just stated? Right. So when we're dealing with protological concepts, we're dealing with the eternality of God in terms of his omniscience to be able to plan and scheme and decree and purpose things before speaking them into existence. Did that make sense? This is why we believe in predestination. This is why we believe in preordination. This is why we believe in the sovereignty of an infinite, eternal God who knows what he's going to do before he does it and purposes it before he brings it to pass. So by the time he actually opens his mouth and by fiat brings it into existence, it's already perfectly fulfilled in his own mind. Right? So we have many motifs in the scripture where the people of God are called out in a protological purpose, a protos. And they have an eschatological end, don't they? The children of Israel coming out of Egypt to go to the promised land. God knows they're going to get into promised land. He knows the elect are going to get into glory. Why? He would have never given us first things if first things didn't affirm the reality of last things. You don't have last things without first things. Are y'all learning something? I'm giving you a framework for biblical theology. Biblical theology is history according to who? So when you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, a scroll is opening up. And you can know that the scroll has an, and the end has come, with an exclamation mark that God doesn't lie, change, or fail. If he said it, he will do it. If he declared it, he'll make it good. Right? And this is why he says, I am the first and I am the last. I am Alpha and I am Omega. You guys follow me on that? He's trying to lay some principles down here. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the what? Paradise of God. That, those are protological images, aren't they? They're not eschatological. We know they're eschatological now because we have the end of the book, don't we? We have Revelation 21. But a person who doesn't read the book of Revelation does not know that the tree that was in the garden at the beginning was uprooted by God called the tree of life and taken all the way to the end of time and plopped down in the revelation and could only be partaken of by those who are overcomers in Christ. 
So every believer from the time of the fall has had to operate by faith in the redemption of Christ and the eternal life in him who becomes for us the tree of life. A tree of life motif is when we finally get to that place where nothing but life will be present and we get to eat of it for all eternity. It's a metaphor. It's not literal. Do you understand that? It's a metaphor of eternal health, eternal qualitative, quantitative health, where we get to eat all of that which is nourishing for all eternity in the presence of God. In your presence are pleasures forevermore, right? All right, under that third point again, the apocalypse is a proto-eschaton. Let me develop that quickly so that I can uh, move through these points. I think this might be where we, because of time's sake, we might not be able to get any further today. Go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Let me help some of you guys with this. I want you to get the first and the last, the first and the last, because this is a privileged imagery and privileged terminology. Here, uh, Baptist folk... Uh, using it in their kind of praise of God, you know, Alpha and Omega and all that. We will use that terminology, but I want you to appreciate it a little bit more richly today. Notice what it says in verse 8. Back up to verse 8, Deb. Now watch this. In verse 8 it says, <clears throat> and I am what? Alpha and Omega. That is the Greek term for beginning or uh, the English or the Hebrew uh, Greek language of Alpha and the close of that alphabetic uh, structure, um, 24 characters, Omega, from Alpha to Omega, the whole uh, Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega. He could have used the Hebrew alphabet, too, but he's dealing with largely Gentiles. So when he uses his terminology, he's not catering to his Jewish brethren. OK. They, they would have heard, understood all of Va and other Hebrew language terms, which are some of that is in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about later, Abaddon and, and other terms that are Hebrew in nature. But this is largely Greek. This is to the church, the body of Christ, that will be largely Gentile. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is what? Is to come, the Almighty. Who's quoting here? Who's talking here? Is it the Father? Is it the son? Is it exclusively the father? Or is it the father speaking through the son? Or is it the son speaking primarily and the father secondarily? Now we're getting into a critical component around the relationship between the father and the son. And let me help you with that because Christians fall all over the map. Be careful of what we call uh, artificial bifurcations. Artificial bifurcations are making what we call either or distinctions whenever propositions are given. Whenever we go either or and, and, and not really having a justifiable base for either or, it's because we're operating out of the simplicity of exclusivism. A lot of times you'll get a question and you go, I think it's this. And somebody go, no, 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 it's that. And now you guys are at odds, right? This is what we call the dialectical process. Can I teach that for a moment? Because this is how politics gets you. Politics gets you by having one person holding a negative view, another person holding a positive view, or one person holding one view and another person holding another view. And they presume that those views are in radical hostility to each other. Now watch this. That you hold one view and I hold another view is not the same as us holding opposite views. Let it settle. That you hold one view and I hold another view does not mean that we're holding opposite views. Raise your hand if it came home. Because for a lot of people, it doesn't come home. This is how husbands and wives fight to the death. And it's rooted in insecurity. I'm going to deal with that today as I deal with strongholds. This is how children and parents get into unnecessary squabbles. Now, you see this in children all the time. And children all the time, when one child says, the ball is red, the other child says, uh, uh the ball is brown. And now they're fighting and arguing. And somebody come and grab the ball. On one side, the ball is brown. On the other side, the ball is red. They're both seeing the same thing from two different perspectives. Did you hear what I just stated? And with kids, they argue in that bifurcation mode all the time. They don't see the possibility of a both and. Y'all with me? And we are often like that. And here's the reason why you will collapse into a into an uh, 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 um, what we would call an either or position because of your insecurity with somebody else having a view different than yours. 
Did you hear what I just stated? The moment you go, I don't think you're right. Well, you might be right that they're not right, but you you may not be right that you're right. Y'all could both be wrong. Or you could both be right. So verse 8 is describing what I would call primarily the voice of the father. But the voice of the father cannot even be heard without the mediation of the voice of the son. The son is the voice of God. I'm getting ready to help you with that. But so what we're dealing with is a proto-eschaton uh, concept here that actually is rooted ontologically in the nature of God. The nature of God is that he is the first and the last. This language is dealing with God's nature. He's not talking about what he does. It doesn't say he does the first and does the last. It says he's, he is the first and he is the last. Anybody with me? Y'all got a little time? Because... You got to know who God is in his nature accurately in order to be able to appreciate what he's done for you on a practical level. Plus, my job is to stretch your brain, because once we start really getting into the book of Revelation, I'm not going to have time to kind of back up and explain everything for you. So here, when it says in verse eight, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the Lord. Then he says, I am the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. What we have here is an identification marker of the eternal God, watch this now, who created all things and is the central object or subject of all history. Now, here's a, this is going to be a time marker for you. He says, the one which is, what do we call that in, in grammar tense? Present tense. Watch this. And the one which was, what do we call that? Past tense. And the one which is to what? What do we call that? So watch this. The book of Revelation cannot be exclusively future. This is what you learn all day today in class. You cannot read the book of Revelation and think that you are dealing with merely future things. The essence of our discussion today was about past things. The garden. The tree of life, hasn't it been? So when Jesus, when the, when the person speaking here says, I am the one who is, he's calling our attention to his, his eternal presence, but I'm also the one who was. He's saying that I am the one who was yesterday. Right. So as I'm dealing with the idea of, of trees and gardens and paradisio images, I'm dealing with that. I'm dealing with the God who presently is revealing to me that he was the one in the past. Y'all follow me with that? And then he finally says, I am the one which is to come. What that means is, as we deal with the book of Revelation moving towards the end of time, you're going to have to hold intention, present realities and past realities along with future expectations. I'm going to say it one more time. In order for you to comprehend the book of Revelation and enjoy it, you cannot exclusively view the book of Revelation as talking about things chronologically only in the future. God's going to take you backwards and forwards progressively through the book of Revelation to help you understand the proto what? Eschaton. The first last principles. Y'all see that? Now, so let me give you a few verses to correspond the relationship between the Alpha and the Omega in verse 8 as referring to the Father speaking through the Son over in verse 10. Here's verse 10. And here in verse 10, we have the Son identified explicitly so we don't have to worry about who's talking here. But well, watch this. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And then verse 11. Here's what it says, saying, I am what? Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what you see right in the book and send it to the seven churches. Do you see verse 11? John heard a voice. He turned to see the voice. And who did he see? Jesus. Jesus is the one talking here, is he not? So Jesus is talking in verse 11 and he's using the same language as the person talking in verse 8, is he not? In verse 8, he says, I am Alpha and Omega. In verse uh, 11, he's saying the same thing. Now, let me share with you something. Go with me in your Bible to Isaiah 44, verse 1. And notice how Jehovah uses his terminology of himself. And you and I don't have to wrestle with whether it's the Father or the Son. It's going to necessarily be both because Jesus is the Father's Hashim. He is the Father's word. He is the one that speaks for the Father. This is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Isaiah 41, verse 4. 
Here it is. Um, there it is. And I probably want to start back at verse. Let me start back at verse one. Get a context for the people who don't know their Bible. Keep silence before me, O island, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near to judgment. Verse 42. Who raised, who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him and made him rule over the kings. He gave them as dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. This is speaking historically about God's use of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians to punish his people. And now he uses his identity marker that we're dealing with. Look at verse three. He pursued them, passed by them safely, even by the way he hath not gone with his feet. This is God using Gentile kings. And then he says, who hath wrought and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the what? First and with the what? I am what? Do you see it? So Jesus is using the same language that Isaiah uses about the character of God 700 years before we get to the book of Revelation. Why is he doing that, Pastor. Because he's letting the church know in the first century who he is in his nature, because the church will for the next 300 years have to battle with who Christ is in his nature. Is he God? Or is he merely a man? Remember, if you are trapped by the dialectic of either or, you're going to fail to answer that question correctly. He's both. He is God from eternity. He's a man in time and the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so the whole of the revelation of scripture brings together this priest who had to be like unto his brethren, man. But he also had to be a perfect priest in order to redeem us from our sins, God. And thus he gets the right to use the nomenclature of I am the first and the last. Nobody gets that but Jesus. You guys got that? Nobody gets to own the daddy's quality, but Jesus, Isaiah chapter 44, if you will. Isaiah 44 now, verse 6. Isaiah 44, 6. I want to use a couple more verses and tie down this concept because our time is about up. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the what of Israel? Now remember, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is viewed as a what? He's King of kings and Lord of lords. So here we are in Isaiah some 700 years before we get to the book of the apocalypse and that title is given to him again, right? Remember what I told you? Your Bible is an unfolding revelation from Genesis to Revelation and that the same titles that are given in the book of Revelation are spread all, all the way through your Bible. This is not new news for people who are rooted and grounded in truth that God is a king. It's not new news that Jesus is king. They've always been king. You know who knew that? The Magi that came from the east when they came to worship the child, they weren't questioning whether he was a king. They honored him as king. Even as a child. So the issue is going to be for the first 300 years of the church. Who is Jesus? Is he God or is he man or is he some little Lilliputian God? Is he a diminished God as as the Gnostics would say, the Marcionites would say, the Jehovah Witnesses would say, and many others? Is he a lesser God? The answer is no. He is equal with the father in his deity. He bears the same qualities of nature as a father and therefore can own the terminology of first and last, beginning and end. Look at what it says. His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the what? And I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. You jacked up now. If you're stuck on, on literal grammar, you're stuck. Because you got two persons saying they're one God. Is that what the grammar says? We know that. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer. We got the split of persons because the Father's the King and the Son's the Redeemer in this text. Now, we know Jesus is the king because he co-reigns with his daddy. Does he co-reign with his daddy? Solomon co-reigned with his daddy, David. We don't have a problem with those categories when you understand your Bible. Well, co-regency is the son and the father reigning together. All right. So here in this context, if we wanted to make a distinction of persons because the grammar would imply it. Thus said the Lord, the king of Israel, the father and his redeemer, the Lord Jesus, the Lord of hosts. And I love it now because he goes back to calling his redeemer Yahweh. See the language? Can y'all track with me? 
Can y'all track with me? This is, listen, if you're going to really be solid in your Bible, you have to be willing to listen to your Bible. There's a lot of arguments come from people who are really not listening to their Bible. I'm going to press you this year to engage your Bibles. I love the Bible because the Bible actually forces you to listen to it if you want to avoid error. And in humility, when we're, when we're humble saints, when we're humbled, let me put the D on the end of that. <laughs> when we're humbled, as bad as it may feel, God now has drawn you near to him to speak to you in ways he doesn't speak to others. Because the proud cannot hear God's word. The humble can. Just in this verse alone, you see two persons bearing singular titles together. Curios and Theos. In the Old Testament, Elohim. Watch this. Thus said Jehovah, I, I should say Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, the king, the father of Israel, and his redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. That's the Lord Jesus. I am the first and I am the last. And besides me, there is no God. Now he goes right back to the singular form. Pastor, you can't do that in grammar. God can. You and I can, but God can. And he does that in order to give us allusions to the mystery of the triune nature of him as God. He actually puts forth his son frequently and pulls him back into his bosom. He puts forth the son frequently and pulls him back into his bosom. And this is why Jesus would say in, Revel in John 17, Father, Father, restore unto me the glory that I had with you before the world began. Restore unto me that glory by which you reveal yourself to me indistinguishably, but sometimes you separate and distinguish us in order to let your elect people know I'm coming in the volume of the book. Y'all tracking with me? It's very important for you to see that. Um, one more verse. I just want to give you one more verse, and our time is up because we got to worship here in a moment. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 48, 12. I wish I had time. I wish I had time. Beautiful text of scripture. I'm going to close with a proposition and then we'll pick up our overview next week. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. Pastor, who's talking? I can help you answer that easily. Pull up verse 16. Isaiah 48, 16. I can help you understand that easily. It's called reading your Bible in context. Look at verse 16. Are you there? Come near ye unto me, draw near. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there I am. Now watch this. And now the Lord God, that's the Father, and his Spirit, that's the third person, has sent me. The one not talking here is the one talking in verse 12. You and I need grace to be able to hear God. We need more grace to be able to hear all three persons when they are talking. And let me close by repeating what I said. What I love about the book of Revelation is that when you just listen carefully to the opening prologue, all three persons reveal themselves to you. The Father reveals himself to us as the one who was and is and is to come. The Spirit reveals himself to us as a sevenfold spirit that is commissioned to go into all the world and draw his elect in. And Jesus reveals himself to us in chapter 1 as the prince of the kings of the earth who laid down his life and has been raised again from the dead and washed us in his own blood. When you have three persons who are willing to show themselves to you in the opening of that letter, that means all three persons care enough about your soul to let you know. They want you to know not just Jesus is calling you, the Father is calling you, and the Spirit of God is calling you into the deep intimacies of their revelation. This is how interested they are in us. Amen.